Yosef is identified himself to the brothers, and now he wants to uh, 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 he wants to contact Yaakov. So on the last word on page two fifty four, last word on the page on page two fifty four. So it says like this, uh, uh, he gives each one and he gives his brothers gifts, and then it says like this, he says, go up to my father, and then the last word on the page, Ula Oviv Sholach Kazos, he sent his father, Asor Chamurim, ten donkeys, Nosim Mituv Mitzrayim, caring from the best of the, what Egypt had to offer, we'll see what there is in a second, the Eser Asonos, and ten mules, uh, she donkeys, Nosos bar valechem carrying provisions for his father for the for the trip down. Now take a look at Rashi, top of page two fifty six, top column on the right. Um, what did he send him? So he says mituv mitzrayim, mituv mitzrayim. It's a right column, top line, right column, top line, last word. Mituv mitzrayim, matzino begumar. The Gemara says sheshalach yelo yayin yoshan. He sent him old wine. Shadas zekenim nochemeno, old wine, which older people uh, uh, really appreciate. Yeah. Now, why is it that older people appreciate old wine? Davi, you know, besides the you know, like, hey, you know, well, you know, why don't you tell me? You know, yeah, no. Besides the besides like old aged wine is good. What else is it? What else? Uh, why would he send them aged wine? Why would he send Yaakov aged wine? And old people enjoy aged wine. What is uh, so the basic idea is the basic idea is uh, obviously old wine you know for wine connoisseurs aged wine the more fine the wine is the better is I don't know if you know anything about wine but there is a whole wine industry with wine tasters there's a, their wine tasters make a lot of money if they're good you know there's, there's a whole art to it the presentation and after pre you know and fruity and this and that and whatever the whatever the wine's supposed to be but the idea is that in the physical world. Almost everything in the physical world, the more, the older it gets, the worse it becomes. The only thing that defies physical law, with rare exception, maybe cheese and salami, mm. but, but with rare exceptions, wine does not obey physical law. Wine, the older it gets, the better it gets. Whereas normally, the older something gets, the worse it gets. Wine, the older it gets, unless it, you mess it up and it turns into uh, vinegar, but wine, the older it gets, the better it gets. An old person suspects, and often rightly so, that you know you're over the hill. You know, we, at one point in life, you were the you were the main you were the main man. You're the money earner. You're the breadwinner for the family. You're the big you're you're the you're, you're the guy. And then as you get a little older, nobody you know you just kind of you know you tell the same stories over and over, and you start to repeat yourself. And then you tell the same stories over and over, and you start to repeat yourself. <laughs> You tell the same stories over and over, you know, and everybody, uh, people basically are, you know, in, 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 in many cases, they're just waiting for him to die so they could get the money already. Just, you know, you're, all, you're over the hill. Nobody really needs you. Nobody respects you. You've, in many cases, you have not accumulated any wisdom that you could share because you've been working your life, doing whatever you're doing, either building or investing or being an accountant. You have nothing more to share than anybody else. You read the paper and I read the papers. Why, why, should, why is your wisdom, what, what have you got that I haven't got? And often people lose respect. The only time that changes is in the Torah world. In the Torah world, the older a person gets, the more Torah, he, the Gemara says, Tamid uh, HaChachamim, uh, uh, the older they get, the wiser they become. And, and, and Amaratzim, people who have never been scholarly, the older they become, they deteriorate. Torah scholars into their 90s are as sharp as they ever were. It's a remarkable phenomenon. You go to the Rabbi El Yashivs, and Rabbi Chaim Kinevskis, and Rabbi Moshe Feinsteins, these are people who are poskating halachas in, the, in their 80s, 90s, and, and some in, in, into their hundreds. Because if you exercise, the brain is like any other muscle in the body, and if you exercise it, it stays sharp. If you sit in front of a television, it's going to turn into marshmallow fluff. That's what's going to happen. And so, so, so Yaakov Avinu, what's Yosef? Okay, so that's why old people enjoy wine. Why does Yosef, why, it's a very nice gift to send Yaakov Avinu. It's obviously a message contained in there. What's the message? Yosef sending him out. Yaakov hasn't been with Yosef for 22 years. What's the message? The message is that Yosef is trying to tell him, listen, I've been in Egypt, but I recognize how, how, what the hierarchy is in our value system. And I recognize that you are still, you know, I haven't allowed these values to, to take me over. I recognize Torah values. You're still, you're the elderly sage here. 
That's a message he's selling him with the wine. The wine is a message to Yaakov, you know, I recognize that you are still the authority, which is something you wouldn't recognize if you've been changed and you've been affected by, by a new environment and a new society, number one. Number two, remarkably enough, the Gemara talks about, there's a conversation in the Gemara where two sages have a conversation. One of them says to the other one, well, you're, they're, they're, they're arguing who's a greater scholar. And each one is trying to give the credit to the other one. And one of the lines that Gorin gives is, well, you're wine, the son of wine. I'm only vinegar, the son of wine. Mm -hmm. And the Gemara uses it in another area to describe somebody who's gone off. That's what he's, his self-description. There's another time where the Gemara, where somebody wants to insult someone because he feels there's a story in the Talmud of uh, one of the sages, Rabbi Elazar, the son of Rabbi Shimon, or Shimon Bar Yochai. This is Rabbi Eliezer, this is Rabbi Elazar, the, Rabbi Elazar, the son of Rabbi Shimon, he was with him in the cave. The famous story of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. So his son Elazar was with him in the cave, and, and at a certain point, uh, because of his wisdom, he was appointed to be a law enforcement official for the nine Jews. And part of his job was catching Jews who were uh, doing things wrong. So one of the other Jews took issue with him and he insulted him by saying, you're vinegar the son of wine. What does vinegar mean? What is vinegar? It's, it's wine that's gone bad. You know, it's the ultimate insult. You're, you're the son of wine. and you're, So Yosef is sending his father aged wine. I'm still, I'm still fine wine. I've not turned to vinegar. When I'm in Egypt, I haven't turned to vinegar. I, I, in spite of the trappings of, of, of being or surrounded by, the, by, by, by all the Egyptian values, I am still the son of aged wine. I myself have not, I, I, I haven't gone off. I haven't gone off. That's the message he sends him with the, that's the message that he sends Yaakov with the wine. By the way, there was an incident going back <laughs> in the last, last 10, 15 years, I remember when it was, they discovered a bottle of wine for the time of Napoleon. The wine from, they discovered a bottle of wine from the time of Napoleon and there was a big ceremony, they're gonna open this wine and all the, all the lords and ladies showed up wearing their finest, you know, for the big ceremony with their go with their with their with their delicate glass goblets, you know. And in the story, I, I mean, just as a Hollywood, just a Hollywood uh, script, you know, the waiter comes walking in with the, with the bottle, and of course he slips on the shiny marble floor, and the bottle goes shattered, gets shattered on the floor, <laughs> and all these lords and ladies throw away their day, and they all lap, jump down on the floor, lapping up the wine to taste the taste the the, the, the you know the wine from the from the 1800s. They jumped on the floor because when are you going to taste wine like that? You know, so so they, you know, just something you couldn't even make it up. And the guy, guy's got to come in with a bottle of wine like that. You hold it in your hands like this, and you walk on a carpet. You don't walk on a marble you floor. Close to your body. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and you know, you know, you know, no fumbles. You don't take any chances. So, so, so that's that's the message. That's the message that Yosef sends him. Is he sends him, he sends him what he called the the uh, 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 he sends him the wine now. Uh, they have to get the word to Yaakov Avinu, and they've already had a bad experience in the family where on a sudden, inform you never tell somebody suddenly even good news. You don't suddenly surprise. I had a friend who went to Israel for a year and he went home. He didn't tell his parents he was coming home, so he managed to, he went home when his parents weren't home, opened the door, and he lay down in bed. So his mother came into the room and found him in bed. After a year of being in Israel, that was our year of yeshiva after high school. And he just went and let his mother find him in bed over there. You don't do that to people. The shock. You know, you don't, you don't shock people. And sometimes it's a surprise. So Sara Imenu, remember when we learned about Sara Imenu, how did she die? Because she heard that Yitzhak had been shechted. Then the Satan came back dressed as Yitzhak, and the shock of seeing him alive killed her. So they were very worried. How are we going to break the news to Yaakov Avinu that Yosef is alive? So there's a medrash that says that Usher, the tribe, you know, there are 12 tribes. One of them was Usher. He had a daughter named Serach. And Sarah knew how to play the harp. So she went into Yaakov Avinu with her harp, and, and she played the harp and started, da -da 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 -da, and started singing. I don't know exactly what the tune was. And she just started singing something, you know, playing the harp to soothe him. And then she starts mentioning Yosef's name, Yosef, 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 is, you know, however, whatever niggin she used. And that's how she broke the news then that Yosef was alive. That's how they broke They didn't want it to come as a shock. And so the Medrash says that Yaakov Avinu said to her, you brought my spirit back to life, therefore I bless you with eternal life. And so the Gemara lists nine people who never died, like the prophet Elio Anavi. One of them is Serach Bas Usher. Serach Bas Usher never died, physical death as we understand it, from the blessing of Yaakov Avinu. Because she's the one who informed Yaakov. Now, that's what the Medrash says. That's how they broke it. The Torah doesn't say, doesn't say that in the written book. In the written book, it says like this. The brothers have to come to Yosef. 
And if you take a look at page 256, fourth line, so it says, Vayagidu um, fourth line, last two words, Od Yosef Chai, Yosef is still alive, Vichihu Moshe Becholeret Mitzrayim, he is ruling over the entire land of Egypt, Vayafa Glibo, how did the Eretz go translate it? His heart rejected it. We'll see in a second. Ki lohem min lohem. He didn't believe that. Because if he is alive, that means he lied to me. The first, you understand, now, now what, what am I supposed to believe over here? And remember, all along he suspected them. All along he suspected them of something. Vayadabro elav es kol divrei Yosef asher divrei elav. And they told him everything Yosef said. Vayar es ha'agolos asher sholach Yosef loses oso. He saw the wagons that Yosef sent. The spirit of Yaakov came back to life. He saw the wagon, and that convinced him. Now, which wagons? Yosef sent wagons. Now, pay attention carefully. It's a very, very, uh, a little bit involved. Take a look at Rashi. Where are my glasses? Take a look at Rashi. Um, it's in the left column. Um, second line from the top. Left column. Es kol divrei Yosef. Says Rashi, Simon Masar Lahem, he sent a sign. Bemehaya Osek Keshapirish Mimenu. What Torah section were they studying, Yosef and Yaakov, when Yosef took leave? The Parshas Egla Arufa. Egla Arufa. Now, Egla is a calf. An Agola is a wagon. Probably called that way because usually oxen that pull wagon, as I imagine. So Yosef sends him wagons called Agolos. And that's going to be a reminder to Yaakov Avinu of the last Torah section. What was the last connection we had? Something about Egla Arufa. Now what is Egla Arufa? Egla Arufa is a procedure the Torah describes later on. You find a dead body. Somebody was murdered. So what they have to do is they have to, the elders of the nearest town have to come out. They take a calf and they kill the calf. They break the calf's neck. He has a symbol that the same way that this guy was murdered, this guy was murdered, did not have a chance to produce offspring, this calf won't have a chance to produce offspring. That's a, it's a ceremony called Egla Arufa. That's what the Torah, and it's, it's right written openly in the Torah, that's what happens. The elders have to go out and they have to make a declaration. Okay, now, Yosef sends him, that was the last thing they were studying. What's the connection? What's one thing got to do with the second thing, and what's the second thing got to do with the third thing? Okay, they were happy to study that Torah. And what, and what, why now? And what, what's it got to do with, with this over here? So very interesting how this, how, this, how this works out. You see how all the pieces fall into place. Do you know that the Gemara says that you escort somebody? Every day you escort a guest. When you leave, you're supposed to walk him for Amos. Now, where does that idea come from? So first of all, when you escort a guest, it shows that you're not that eager to get rid of him. You're not that eager, but if you just say to the guest, bye at the door, and close the door on him, good, you know, goodbye, good riddance. But when you walk him out the door, it makes the guest feel like you didn't really want him to leave. I walk the guests to make sure they leave. But they, yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's what do you call it? it, doesn't, it it's a way you escort the guests because it shows that you're, 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 you can't pay your parting in such sweet sorrow. So you walk the guest out. But the Gemara says that you escort a guest. If a guest is escorted, he's protected. He's protected. Why is he protected? Because in the old days, you know, a guy left town. You escorted him outside of town. When we escort a guy into the corridor, that's not the escort the Gemara is talking about. You should escort your guests. But the Gemara is talking about escorting him outside past the city limits. Because a guy leaves the town, and he's on either a horse or he's by foot. There are highwaymen. There were bandits. There were people who could assault him. But if they see he's been escorted, they recognize that there's going to be some sort of uh, 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 accountability, accountability. So that can actually protect them. They go, you know, guys, hands off of this one. You know, lay off because this guy's got somebody who we're going to, somebody's going to wonder where he is. Yosef, remember, how did he get to the brothers? He was sent off by Yaakov Avinu. He was sent by Yaakov Avinu to the brothers. Yosef is sending a message to Yaakov Avinu, and the commentary is going two directions with this. One message he's sending Yaakov Avinu is the last thing we were involved with was Egla Arufa, meaning, had you escorted me, you knew you were sending me into a dangerous situation. Had you escorted me, none of this would have happened. That means you, to a certain extent, carry a liability for the fact that we've been separate for 22 years. That's the message he's sending him. He's sending him out. Yeah, we were studying Egla Arufa. 
But why were we studying Egla Arufa? We're studying Egla Arufa because it has to do with the idea that had you escorted me, we wouldn't have any of this aggravation. You sent me off to the brothers. You should have escorted me. He's saying this to his father? He's sending that message to his father. Why would he send that message? No, not a nice thing to send after 22 years. Hi, Dad. Great to see you. By the way, you owe me money. You know, you know, what, what, what is that? You, know, you owe me an apology. Well, what was that for? So, so the commentaries say, you know what the Ramban says, Vayofa Glebo means? The art school translated as his heart rejected it. The Ramban says, the Ramban says his heart actually, he, he experienced almost heart stoppage. Again, the shock. And Yosef knew that. Yosef knew that the joy of hearing that Yosef is alive could cause heart stoppage. So Yosef intentionally sent a sad message as well to counteract the joy. To counteract, if I'd say to you, Alex, your, this, your, your, your lottery ticket, you want a lot of money, Alex. It's about $10 million. Your mother-in-law is going to be delivering it. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> that, should, that should counteract a little bit. They, you know, pre- create, the, create the counterbalance, on the, create the, counterbalance on, on the thing. That's what Yosef wants to do. That's what some of the commentaries say. Other commentaries say to the contrary. Other commentaries say to take it in the opposite direction. It was, a, it was a joy. They're saying to Yosef for sending him a message that because you escorted me, in other words, the Torah doesn't say whether Yaakov Avinu did or not. The commentary seeing this, Yosef was saying, because you escorted me, I was protected. I didn't end up getting killed. That it was specifically because you were, yes, we were separated, but at the end of the day, I didn't get killed. I'm still alive to talk about it. So there are different opinions exactly which way, which way to go with it. But Yosef is sending Yaakov a message that, number one, that's what we were studying. Even more than that, what's it, what, what, what do you think is contained in that message? What do you think Yaakov's concern about Yosef is? I think Yaakov's main concern is. Yaakov's main concern about Yosef is not his physical well-being. Well, what's happened to him? What's happened to him? He's been in Egypt for 22 years on his own. What's happened to this kid? What's happened to him in Egypt? Sends him a message, Dad, this is the last thing we're going to Don't worry, I didn't forget anything. I didn't forget. I'm still the same Yosef. I'm the same Yosef. You got nothing. You sent me off. I wandered off. I was all by myself. I'm the still Yosef. And that's why the commentaries say, when he said, the, the brothers were conveying that message themselves. They said, Yosef is still alive and he rules over all of Eretz Mitzrayim. What do you mean you rule over it? What do you mean you rule over it? Egypt doesn't rule over him. He rules over Egypt. Yosef rules over Egypt. Yosef has not been taken down by Egypt. Yosef is in total control. He rules over it. Anything that rules over you, it could be caffeine, and it could be, it could be nicotine, it could be anything that rules over you, you're a slave. A free man is somebody who rules over something else. You rule it. It does not rule you. Yosef rules over Mitzrayim, not Mitzrayim ruling over Yosef. Okay? That's the idea. So Yaakov decides he's going to go down to see Yosef. And then take, let's take a look at the, at, the, uh, uh, at the reunion. They get ready to go down. Then Torah goes into a review of their names. Ve'es Yehuda Sholach Lefanov El Yosef. Four lines from the bottom, page 260. Ya- Yaakov sends Yehuda out ahead to Yosef, Lahoros the fun of Goshen, uh, to prepare the way in the land of Goshen. Rashi says to set up a base medrash there. First thing you got to have is a base medrash to go to. Vayavo Artsa Goshen. Vayes or Yosef Merkavto. Yosef harnesses up his chariot. Now, this is roughly the equivalent of the President of the United States pumping gasoline into his limousine. Right, the president's got to go to an important meeting, and he goes out and he grabs the hose to pump the limousine, pump gas into his own limousine. You know the story of George Bush, by the way? There's a story. I don't know if it's true or not. It could be it's true. If it's not, it's an apocryphal. It's a George Bush and his wife, apparently. What's her, what was her name? Laura. So they're in the presidential limousine, and they're in some, some motorcade somewhere in Texas, and one of the cars had to stop to get gasoline at a gas station. So the whole motorcade stops. So Mrs. Bush gets out of the limousine. Have you heard this? I've heard about different presidents. A different presidents. Oh, okay, yeah. so then I guess it's apocryphal. <laughs> she gets out of the limousine, and she starts schmoozing with the gas station attendant. And she gets back into the limousine, and George says to her, well, what was that all about? She goes, oh, there's just a guy I dated in high school. So he starts laughing. She says, what's so funny? She, he goes, well, you could have married him, and instead you married the president of the United States. She says to him, you got it wrong. If I would have married him, he would have become the president of the United States. <laughs> and I got news for you. It's probably, there's a lot more truth there than we'd like to admit. The, the, there's a statement that Gemara have a Omer hakol min ha'isha. The Gemara says there was a tzaddik who married a wicked woman and he became wicked. 
and a wicked man who worried at Sadekis, and he became a tzaddik. And the Gemara says, Hey, Omer, from this you must say, you must conclude, Hakomina Isha. It all comes from the wife. It all comes, which is true. Which is absolutely true. When you get married, you know the attitude of when a guy gets married, don't your attitude it will be? I guarantee you. When you're standing under your chuppah, Mirza Hashem, your attitude's going to be, she's wonderful, and I hope she's always like this. You know what she's going to be thinking? He's got wonderful potential. That's all the difference right there, gentlemen. Take it to the bank. Right? That's what it's all about. Right? She, you, she is not your project. You're fine with her. As long as she cooks, takes care of you, you're fine. Right? You're a project. <laughs> Get used to it. <laughs> you are a project. And she was put in this world to help this project to achieve all of his potential. That's what is there. That, that, that's, that's the bottom line. So Yosef harnesses up his chariot because he wants to honor his father. And then Vayali Kras Yisrael Aviv Gosha. He goes out to head towards his father. Pay attention. Look at the words carefully. Two lines from the bottom. Vayera Elov, he appears to him. Yosef appears to his father. Vayipol al Savarov, he falls on his neck. Vayef al Savarov, he cries very much on Yaakov's neck. He's wrapped around Yaakov's neck crying. Bottom of page 260. Bottom of page 260. Last two lines. Page 260. So the first thing you got to notice here is it says, Vayera Elov, he appears to him. That means in Yosef's, imagine how Yosef feels. 22 years, he hasn't seen his father. What's he thinking about, though? But look at the words, Vayera Elov, which translates that he appears to him. He appears to him. What does that tell you? What was Yosef? What did Yosef want? Or what was Yosef thinking about? He wants more than anything else to be able to see his father, right? What's Vayera if he appears to him? What does appears to him mean? He's not thinking about what he wants. He's what his father wants. I want to see my father, right. but I want. I'm thinking about my father wants to see me. I am appearing to my father right now. It's not that I'm I'm looking to to see my father. Words, I'm appearing to my father because my father wants to see me. In other words, he's running to see his father. But in, under, in, contained in this is the mitzvah of honoring his father by allowing his father to see him. Very, so, yeah, you hear the difference. In other words, it would have said, Vayar, Yosef saw him. Why is it Vayera Elav? Yosef appeared to him. Because that was what Yosef had intended. Yosef's in goal here was to say that his father should see him. You're going over to, uh, 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 you're bringing, your wife says, bring a pizza home tonight. What's your intent? You're going to eat the pizza and she's going to eat the pizza. What's your intent? Is your intent that she should enjoy it, or your intent is that you should have it and she's just to throw it? In other words, which is, which is your primary intent? Yosef wants desperately to see his father, but his primary intent is his father should see him because he's got to think about what his father's needs are. It's a very subtle, it, it, they're both going to happen. Yeah. Okay, however, take a look at Rashi. Take a look at Rashi. It says Yosef threw himself on his neck and he cried. And uh, 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 take a look. At the bottom line of the page, bottom line in Rashi, left column, left column of Rashi, bottom line. So it tells Yosef fell on Yaakov's neck and he's cried. It says the bottom line of Rashi, Aval Yaakov lo no fall al tzavari Yosef. Yaakov did not hug Yosef. Velona shako, he didn't kiss him. Yaakov did get 22 years. The Amur Senu, Gomorrah says, Shehaya kore eshma. He was in the middle of reading Kriyashma. Yaakov was saying Kriya Shema. What's Kriya Shema? Shema Yisrael Hashem Eloikeinu. Sorry for that. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yosef's hugging Yaakov, Yaakov's saying Shema. And if Yaakov's saying Shema, you think Yosef knows it? You think he knows, you think he knows he's not getting hugged by his father he hasn't seen in 22 years? Isn't that interesting? Why is Yaakov saying Kriya Shema now? So there, there, there are certain people, that, that, so one of the approaches is, well, you know, there's a mitzvah, you have to say Kriyashma by a certain time. You know, there's a man Kriyashma in the morning. By the third hour of the day, you have to have said Kriyashma. It was close to the end of the Zman. Yaakov had no choice. Listen, hug shmug. I got I to gotta do my mitzvah and say Kriyashma. Hmm. Well, I mean, if you're doing your mitzvah, why didn't Yosef do the same mitzvah? He did earlier. He did uh, earlier. So why didn't Yaakov do it earlier? And why was Yaakov waiting for now to do a great show? Yeah, that, that's the standard explanation. Okay, maybe yeah, maybe no. There are others that say what you're supposed to do, what Yaakov is really trying to do is he wants, there's a moment of extreme joy, intense joy. Take that moment and dedicate that moment to God. Mm -hmm. You're never going to have a moment like this in life again. You're not going to have a moment like this in life. You win the lottery, say Kriyashma. Yeah. Take, take all that joy before you start jumping up and down. Take all that joy and channel that joy upwards. 
And Yaakov is taking this as a moment, and I'm going to channel that joy upwards. At this moment, right, at the peak, at the peak of your joy, take that moment and, and channel that moment upwards. My daughter said that Yaakov you know, was worried that the joy is going to kill him, so he sang Christ right for a day. Very interesting. My daughter said that. My daughter said that maybe Yaakov you know, was also worried that he might die from the joy. I better say one grass crash right now, because who knows if I'm going to be able to handle this. Very nice. It's a very, it's a very nice idea. I had a different idea here. I had a different idea. I think that Yaakov Avino, again, if Yosef's hugging Yaakov, Yaakov's not hugging, he knows he's not being hugged. He knows he's not being kissed by his father, who, who, who arguably misses him more than he misses the father. The relationship from parents to children is more intense than from children to parents. Children need parents. Parents love children. It's a completely different relationship. Completely different relationship. And Yaakov Vina is not hugging him. So I, I, I suspect Yaakov Vina, Yosef was his prime disciple. Yosef was his life project. He was going to be the heir of the entire spiritual inheritance, whatever Yaakov was going to pass down. Yaakov just lost 22 years of being able to train Yosef in the ultimate value, which is a life is about serving God. Yaakov decides, I got one opportunity now to give him a lesson that he is never going to forget that's going to make up for all 22 years. Mm -hmm. All 22 years are going to get made up for in one moment. You know what that moment's going to be? At the moment that he knows that there's nothing I'd rather do than hug him, at that moment he's going to hear me saying, Chris, but I'm not hugging him, devoting my love to God instead. So, it's a lesson he's never going to forget. So the lesson is that we're going to get. Therefore, Yaakov finds very auspicious moments to be able to say, Kriya Shavon. Sure, it's all planned in advance. It's all planned in advance. There are certain lessons in life that people, people will learn that in a momentary lesson, you're going to learn a lot more than anything else. You can, you can learn something. Sometimes some of the lessons you learn in life, with all the effort. I had once, I was in yeshiva. I came to, in my year after high school. I was a modern Orthodox kid. And, and the last thing I wanted to do was study. It was learn. But I also wanted to get away from home. And all my friends were going to yeshiva for a year. So I went to, I went to a, you know, a modern yeshiva here in Israel. I was there for a year, I didn't do much, and I came back for a second year. After bumming around for another three months, I decided that's enough, time to go, time to go home. So I walked into the Rosh Yeshiva, and I had gone hot and cold sometimes. I learned sometimes, I did, I wasn't really into it. I went into the Rosh Yeshiva, I said, and, and Rosh Yeshiva liked me. He didn't like me because I was learning. He, he liked me, thought I was strange, I was American. Mm. And he, he, so I went into Rosh Yeshiva and I said, um, by the way, I've decided to leave. I decided to go home. So he sticks out his hand, he says to me, Bat You should be successful. So I looked at him and I said, aren't you, what, is that it? You know I mean, you're not going to tell me to try to convince me to stay? So he looks at me, he had a sad look on his face. But oh, did I learn a lesson. I was 18 years old, 19 years old. He says to me, if you would have come in and you would have said to me, what should I do? I'm not learning well. I'm not enjoying myself. Said to you, okay, maybe take a week off, go to keyboards, air out a little bit. What is it? But you didn't come in to ask me. You came in, you informed me. You informed me you're leaving. Informed me you're leaving? To that I say, that's lawful. That's probably the one that, either the only or certainly the most important thing that I learned. I've used that. I've used that on people. And I've, I've used that since when people, when people come to inform me of things. Okay. Somebody says that we tell them something dramatic. Okay. Why aren't you going to, oh, well, you didn't ask me. You told me. If you told me, my, my response to being told things is okay. <laughs> I learned that from him. So sometimes in life, you can get a momentary lesson. That's the most important lesson you're ever going to get. The important lesson in one moment. That's what Yaakov. Now, turn back for a second. Turn back for a second. When Yosef, I, I just want to show you, with, with, I skipped this, but let's go back. Let, let's go back uh, for one second. Go back to uh, where Yosef it reveals himself to the brothers. Um... So, on page, um, Yosef kisses each one of the brothers, and then um, on page 254, back on page 254. So it says like this, he, he reveals himself to the brothers, and then it says, Vayipol al Savore binyamin ochiv, he falls on binyamin's neck, Vayefkin, he cries, Ubinyamin bacha al tsavarov. And Binyamin cries on his neck. Uh, you know, to give a hug, you fall around the neck, you know, give, yeah, like that, you know. So uh, uh, Rashi is bothered by the fact that Savare, when it says Savari Binyamin, is plural. It's almost like he falls on Binyamin's necks. 
And then Binyamin falls on his neck in the singular. So take a look at Rashi over here on Posig Yudalit. It's the right column of Rashi, two lines from the bottom on page 254, right column of Rashi. Vayipol al Says Rashi, he had a prophetic, it was a prophetic a moment of tears. Al shnei mikdashos, he was crying for the two temples. Sheosidim liyos v'chalko sholdit binyamin, they are destined to be built in the portion of binyamin. V'sof and lecharif, and then the two Beis HaMikdashos are going to be destroyed. Yosef was crying for the future Beis HaMikdashos that are going to be destroyed. U'binyamin bocha al tzavarov, binyamin was crying on his neck. What was he crying for? Al mishkan shilo, the tabernacle in shilo. She'osid liyos v'chalko shol Yosef v'sof and lecharif, and it's going to be destroyed. So they're crying for future destruction. Yeah, but there's an obvious question. Besides the prophetic aspect of it, there's still an obvious question. What about the now? Like, What's that? Okay, they're obviously crying for now, but somehow contained in that is the future, right? But besides that aspect of it, something else, let's say they cry for the future. Let's say they, they had prophecy, they cried for the future. Still something surprising about it, isn't there? Where are all the other brothers? He's going gonna, gonna to hug them in a second. Okay. He's going to hug them in a second. Right? So still something should Shabbat. Others, so What's that? Time for the others, yes, yes. Why are they cross crying? Binyamin should cry. I mean, you're already crying for the future. So Binyamin could cry for his base of Mikdashes. And Yosef should cry for his Mishkan. Why? Yosef's crying for Binyamin's base of Mikdashes. And Binyamin is crying for Yosef's Mishkan. Now why are you cross crying? There, the Rashi says there's some sort of prophetic yeah. intuition, or maybe, with, well, again, I don't know if it's at a conscious or subconscious level, but Yosef is crying for the two base of Mikdashes that are going to be in his brother's portion that are going to be destroyed, and Binyamin's crying for the, for the tabernacle that's going to be Yosef's portion that's going to be destroyed. I mean, if you're going to cry for the future, you cry for your base of Mikdashes, and I'll cry for money. What do you say, Ian? But your responsibilities, your, your heartaches, like, you, you bear that. Like, you just, you go through that. And, and you, you give sympathy, you give empathy to other people. Oh, 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 yeah, oh very good, very good. So you see, Yosef and Mary, what they're really crying about? Why, are they, why have they been separated? Let's, stay, let's, let's change that for a second. Why was the base of English destroyed, the second base of English? Baseless hatred. Baseless hatred. What has caused the separation of Yosef and Benjamin right now? They're crying for the very causes that are going to destroy that base of Migdash. The very, and what's the rectification? Exactly what you're saying. The, rectif- the opposite of baseless hatred is concern for other people. The very thing that separated us, the opposite is to be a little bit concerned about each other. We've been separated because everybody's only thinking about themselves. Every fight, every fight will always be because you're thinking about yourself. Every fight's always when you think about yourself. That's why when my kids come into me and they're fighting, especially the girls, you know, they're fighting over something. So it, by me, it's standard operating. I just tell them, you're both wrong. You're both wrong, mm-hmm. which is very possible in life. In most fights, that's the way it is. Mm-hmm. You're wrong for taking her sweater, and you're wrong for making such a big deal out of it. <laughs> you're both wrong. You're both wrong. You're wrong for doing it. You're wrong, wrong, wrong. And you're wrong for making such a big deal, because taking your sweater is not the end of the world. So the sweaters are for them, to be worn and you weren't wearing it. So you're both wrong. None of you are any good, right? So Yosef and Binyamin, the way you, re- you know, there's a statement that Gemara says, listen to this statement. Gemara says, somebody who goes to a wedding and he glads the chassan at a wedding, you go to a wedding, you bring joy to the chassan at the wedding, it's as if you have rebuilt one of the ruins of Jerusalem. I've been at a wedding in New Jersey. And I'm gladdening Chassan. Why am I rebuilding the ruins of Jerusalem? In other words, in other words, when you go to a wedding of all times, of all times, when I go to a wedding, many people go to a wedding, my first question is, is there going to be a smorg? Right? The smorg is it. Right? The smorg is it. You know, is there gonna be a smorg? Where am I gonna sit? Where am I gonna be sitting? And who am I gonna be sitting next to? You notice how the I word got in there? Mm-hmm. I was about nine years old. I was about nine years old. My father once said to me, don't, you know, leave the word I out of your vocabulary. Apparently I was saying it a lot. He said, leave the word I out of your vocabulary. So I remember wondering, but how am I going to talk about myself if I can't say I? Yeah. You know? <laughs> how does that work? <laughs> Me? <laughs> what's that? What's you go to a wedding, you think about yourself. Of all times in life, 
You go to a wedding and you gladden him, there's nothing in it for you. This is not about you right now. It's all about him. Why was the base of Migdash destroyed? Baseless hatred, because everybody's thinking about themselves. The rectification, you want to build one of the ruins of Jerusalem. You're building one of the ancient ruins of Jerusalem by going to a wedding and gladdening, gladdening somebody else at the wedding. Then you're building one of the ancient ruins of Jerusalem. That's the, whole, that's the whole idea. The whole idea is to be able to go and take the focus off yourself. That's why Yosef would be on our cross crying over here. That the whole separation is a result of too much self-focus. Now we can go back and start rebuilding. That's what the commentary say. Vayave Yosef as Yaakov Aviv, Vayabideo Lifnei Paro. Yosef brings Yaakov his father and he places him before Paro. Vavarach Yaakov as Paro. Yaakov gives Paro a bracha. Uh, Rashi says that, I think that the, the uh, uh, Rashi says he greets him like anybody who meets the king. Vayomer Paro el Yosef, Kami Yemei Shnei Chayecha. Paro says to Yaakov, sorry, Vayomer Paro el Yaakov, top line of page 264, Kami Yemei Shnei, how old are you? Vayomer Yaakov el Paro, top of 264, second line on page 264. Vayomer Yaakov el Paro, Yemei Shnei Magurai, the years of my life, Shloshimu Mas Shana. I'm 130 years old, not as old as I look. Me'at v'roim hoyu Yemei Shnei Chayai, I've had few and difficult years, I'm not as old as my father. Yitzhak died at 180. Yaakov, uh, Avrino was supposed to died at 175. Yaakov was supposed to live, right now he's 130. He's a young, he's a spring chicken. He's 130. And he looks like a weathered old man. Paro looks at him and goes, how old are you? How old are you? And Yaakov says, well, I'm not as old as I look. I'm only 130. I'm not the age of my father. And then, the, then later on we find Yaakov dies when he's 147. And he was supposed to have died when he was 180. There's a medrash that said he lost 33 years of his life for every word of complaint that he said over here. Yaakov says, oh, I'm old. It was a hard, it's been a hard life for me, and I'm nowhere near as old. For every word that he said, there are 33 words, for every word that he said, he lost a year of his life. So one of the commentaries says, yeah, but that's a problem. Because if you count the words that Yaakov said, you only end up with 25. But Yomer Yaakov, I'll probably make only 25 words in that Only 25 words in that Pesach. So Chaim Shmulevitz said, what's that? He only said 21. You only said 21. Okay, but there's a Pesach. Okay, so for the whole Pesach, the Pesach gets thrown in. So it's only 25 words. So Chaim Shmulevitz says, yeah, but the previous Pesach had eight words. Why did Paro even ask the question? Because Yaakov at his level, again, Yaakov had a very hard life. At his level, it was being worn on his sleeve. He elicited the question. His appearance elicited a question. A guy walks in, and you look at him and say, what's wrong? Why are you asking him what's wrong? Without him saying a word, why are you saying what's wrong? The guy comes in dragging his feet, looks downcast. What's wrong? So you're at fault for me asking the question because a person has to learn to keep life's problems in the proper perspective. If something's happening, we believe it's all for the good. Now, this is obviously easier said than done. Obviously, it's easier said than done when you find out that your stocks are all down, you know, and you're supposed to, but don't wear it on your, obviously, we're supposed to, oh boy, I wish that didn't happen to me. Or if somebody's account gets hacked on the internet, mm -hmm. on, on, on the email. So I, you know, okay, it happened. Deal with it. You know, not, nobody says nobody says to make a kiddish in shul. On the other hand, you know, why 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 is it written all over your face? You're accountable. That's not how we're supposed to greet. Like what what Hashem deals with us, difficult. We're not supposed to walk around with a sad face. We're not supposed to let it etch itself into our into our in, in, into our appearance where other people can see that we're downcast. Yaakov Avinu, in spite of the difficulty they had at his level, he's taking the task for it. Yaakov elicits the question from Paro, that's an extra eight words. Eight and 25 is 33, and as a result, Yaakov Vino is accountable, and he loses 33 years of his life, as the Torah says. Okay, tomorrow we'll start with Parshas Vayachik.